opportunity to see my brothers. Did everybody get a chance to see my brothers' uh, documentary about our family? Yes. Um, so I could tell you a little bit about that process um, because it was an important process for us as a family. My brother came to me and asked me if um, if I thought my mother would participate in it because it was um, my mom is a very welcoming person and um, I had my brother come and stay at her house when he was in Chicago and you know stay with me and, and so you know we were just moving forward with building a relationship because I had not met him until I was um, 17 and so you know I knew of him after I was around 15 but I hadn't, I hadn't had a chance to meet him and so once we met and connected, um, you know, that bond between brothers, you know, I always wanted a younger brother and now, you know, I have one. And so we, um, you know, we just kind of focused from there. How you doing? Hello. Good. And, uh, and so it was, so he asked if, if we would do the, if my mom would participate. And when I talked to her about it, you know, she thought about it. She said, "Yeah, if it if it helps you guys at all, I, I I will do it. You know, if it helps connect you and and explain and clarify things, I'll do it." And so we started the project. We, I was living in Atlanta. I just started practicing law, and we went to Chicago. We were in Chicago for a couple of days shooting, and went through that whole process. Uh, with my father. My father hadn't been back to that house. Um, in fact, my mom just sold the house last month. But my father had not been back to that house in 20 years, you know, some around about 20 years at that time. And so it was just a real emotional, you know, time to kind of think about some of the things that we went through as a family, some of the transitions and things of that nature. And, um, Surprisingly, it was nominated for an Academy Award, and so we went out to LA and participated in that. And you know, he didn't win, but it was his first film, and so he still is doing uh, films and commercials and documentaries. Um, I talk to my dad every day. I talk. My mom moved here, so I see her and talk to her um, every day. And I talk to my brother probably once a week, uh, or once every other week. He just turned 40, so big, big celebration. And so, um, so that's kind of a that's kind of an update um, about kind of where our family is. My, they, everybody was together when my youngest son, um, Kahari, graduated from eighth grade. So my mother, my father, my father's wife, Megan, um, all of us, Hubert, were all together. So that was two years. Ago. And then we're all together here in Atlanta. <clears throat> so, um, you know, it's it's one of those things where, you know, we have these family dynamics, and we have to try to figure out a way to um, make sense of it. You know, when you're a kid, like I was, it was there were all kinds of it was a strain. You know, um, one of the things that, that was not said um, overtly was that there were instances of domestic violence in my household. And so I saw that and that was painful. And um, so that was some of what I alluded to in the poem. And, you know, of, you know, of course now my father has apologized to my mother, to me, to, but, but when you're in the moment, that kind of intimate violence, um, it impacts you. And you have to decide whether you're gonna break the cycle or not, and that's the decision that I made, so that I would never, um, I wanted to make a commitment to my myself and to my, my wife and to my children that I would never um, engage in domestic violence or do anything that would make them feel the way I felt, you know, because that's what you remember, is how you how you felt when certain things happened to you, um, or you observe and see certain things happening to people you love. So. Um, with that, I'm open for questions, you know, and then we can pick up, pick the conversation up. Do you think that your father's um, experience growing up with his mother and 
um, the men that she was with, do you think that that affected him and how he raised his family? Yeah, it, you know, he didn't have any, any go by. you know. Um, he had no foundation. His father, he didn't know his father. He, he had no relationship with him. He didn't know what it was like to sit down for a family dinner, you know, with, with, with all parents. And that just didn't happen. And so he was, um, he was trying to figure it out. And um, I think he learned, you know, he caught some glimpses of, you know, it was, it was a real strange dynamic. So there were times that when he was home, he traveled a lot because we, when he was with the Globetrotters, he was on the road a lot. But when he was at home, he would try to make a point of, we got to all sit down and have dinner. He was trying to create something that he, had, he hadn't experienced himself where, you know, Turn off the TV, everybody sit down, let's eat at one time, you know. And he was trying to create something and trying to set. So he was, um, and so you see all of these different kinds of contradictions, you know, that's playing out in, in, in him. So there were times, like, I fixed my son's breakfast every morning because when he was in, when he was in our house, um, he was in my, our house up until the eighth grade, when he was there, he fixed breakfast, lunch, that was what he did. And so, you know, so I got that, right? But that's one of the things, you know, I had to, you know, I didn't have to learn, you know, so I got that piece. But at the same time, he would, um, you know, go off and, you know, be off for a period of time, you know, dealing with, um, you know, his stuff. You know, he had alcohol, drug issues as well. So it was a real kind of tangled web of, you know, I want to give my family something I didn't have, but I keep getting kind of pulled back to being this person that I that I saw growing up through different men who were in my, my grandmother's life, my, my grandmother's life, so. That's so interesting that you said <clears throat> that he was full of contradictions, because that's exactly what they said about Ruth in the color of water that mommy was just a heap of contradictions you know and it's partially because of the way that she was raised and her wanting to get away from that but also wanting to keep rules established in her household and traditions in her household and they sometimes conflicted with the way she was raised and they didn't understand the way she was raised anyway so it's just so interesting to hear the same phrases and the same sentences in the documentary and then when you're speaking, they connect immediately to the you know the book that we read. Um, Lashar had a question that I thought went along with what we were speaking about. So Lashar. Okay. Um, do you believe that um, struggle is a necessity for success in the form of not growing up in a two-parent household? Struggle is a necessity for success. Um. You know. I'm hungry. I'm, I'm hungry because of my um, the way I was raised. You know, I'm, I'm, I want to um, to be successful, to be significant, to have to have meaning. Um, I don't. It, it, I think it becomes harder for. I think it's hard for my sons. You know, where mom and dad, and we're you know, my mom, my wife's a teacher, and we're. You know, we're trying to create an, an, an environment. And so they've been given a lot, you know. And, and I was given a lot, but they, they're, they're given more, you know. Um, and so it's hard for them to be hungry, you know, to, to have gone through some stuff. And, um, but it, I don't want to minimize their experience. You know, I think that, that they have their own challenges of just being teenagers in 2015. It's, that's a... There are challenges you guys have that I didn't have, and they're unique to this experience in this moment. And so um, I don't want anyone to believe that um, the only way to be successful is you have to come from this, this gritty, grimy background. I think that we've seen young people, and I'm, I'm, my prayer is my sons coming from a, a healthier environment that I came out of, that they will also um, find their way to success. I think it's a different road. And, and one of the challenges, and I think even 
and I've been reading um, the book as well. I haven't finished mm -hmm. it, so y'all don't tell me the end. Um, <laughs> but one of the one of the challenges is embracing who you are, um, all aspects, because when you do that, I believe that's when you're that's where you get your strength from. Right? When you negate, when you deny certain aspects of your existence, of your experiences, then I think it weakens you. You know, and I, I always make the comparison. Um, I'm a basketball, you know, head. So I'm always making comparisons using basketball as an analogy. And, and when I look at LeBron James, who had a great fourth quarter last night, had 17 points. <laughs> and, and you look at a, a Dirk Nowitzki, who's another great player. And my position is that if they played a one-on-one -on -one and LeBron James tried to play Dirk Nowitzki style, that Dirk would beat him because Dirk's always going to be better at being Dirk than LeBron James imitating him, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's the same for us. We have to each embrace who we are and imitating other folks, it weakens our power and strength in this world. Because there's something that each of y'all have to give this world, each of you have to give to it, like someone else in our community, that if you don't know who you are, if you don't embrace who you are, we're going to miss it. We're really going to miss it. And we, but we need it, right? We need your voice. We need your perspective. So don't give it away because, you know, you're like, I want to be somebody else. Be, embrace who you are. And so in that, that just goes to the, 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 the issue of whether you grow up in this, this gritty neighborhood. You know, I, I represent kids all the time who grow up in a two-parent household and want to be thugs. It's absurd. You know, we see that in what we do. You can't grow up in the suburbs and be, be a thug. Stop. <laughs> you know? but, uh, but, that's, but that's what that's what's plenty. You know what I mean? Um, and then we go. We went to see Chance the Rapper, and, um, and he's, uh, you know, he's from Chicago, and he, you know, he, he has the stuff that he says is obviously different from the stuff that Chief Keith says, right? Um, but coming from Chicago, he could try to be that Chief Keith, but that wouldn't be authentic. You know, you understand? So being being authentic is what gives you value. And people recognize it in a heartbeat, and they'll be drawn to you, and you'll be able to positively influence. Them. So, this is Jacob, by the way. Jacob, mm -hmm. how you doing? Good, good. So, uh, at the beginning, you were talking about how uh, you hadn't met your brother until you were seventeen. Mm -hmm. But uh, how was it so easy, and what made you uh, want to have a relationship and love him as soon as you met him? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it really is about my mom. My mother is like, we had to get her to move from Chicago because she was helping so many people all the time, all of our family, you know, she's retired and folks are coming, you know, can I borrow this, borrow that, it's just, so is my mom. My mom is just a loving person and, um, and we had a huge, she is one of seven. And, um, and so I had all of these aunts and cousins and, you know, it was just an extended family. And when somebody came around, you know, oh, that's your cousin. Oh, okay. You know, and you just embrace them. And so if you just embrace, if you embrace your cousin like that, then you got to embrace your brother, you know. Um, and my grandmother, um, my father's, my father's mother, um, she was really a you know really strong woman probably about this tall and um, but just a really strong determined woman who had gone through so much and she wanted us you know wanted my brother and I to to be in in a relationship and uh, and he was just a sweet kid you know I mean he was so it's one of those things when you connect the positive things that, that are placed into you by your, by my mom, and the positive things that are placed into him by his mom and, and my dad, and it was just, it was, you know, we just pulled together. Yeah. The students are writing their memoirs right now, um, kind of modeled on the color of water, nice. and so 
those family relationships are at the forefront yes. of what we're discussing in class all the time. Um, this is Renal. So that's your question, right, Renal? That's not. <laughs> somebody didn't put their name on it. I thought it was your name. You can read that one, Renal. Uh, well, <laughs> are there things that you would say to your parents now that you wouldn't have said um, when you were younger? Hmm. Um, whose question was that? Rishana. That yours? What's your name, sister? Rishana. Rishana? Okay. Um, you know, there are conversations that I, that I have now. My, now my, you know, my mom is 76, my dad is 78. And so it's kind of like, what is my purpose for saying certain things to them at this, at this point? You know what I mean? Like, I talk to them, um, but we had our conversations during the, during the making of, of hardwood. We had we had those conversations, you know. So I think that there is there is a time for your own spirit that if, if if something isn't sitting right or you feel feel something that you need to have that conversation. Um, for me, that time has passed. I'm 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 good now, you know. I'm good now. I, I've, I've said all that I needed to say. Um, my father upset me um, when my youngest son was graduating from the eighth grade because, you know, in my mind, I, I got half a fatherhood from him, and my brother got a half of a fatherhood from him. And there were times that after he moved, he was very disconnected from me. And so, in my mind, you're going to be a better grandfather than you are a father. You know, I'm going to make that happen. So I'm going to be on your your button, make that happen, Dad. You know, and so he was coming to um, Atlanta for um, he was coming to Atlanta for the graduation. He was talking about only staying three days. I'm like, dude, that's crazy. And so I wrote him a I wrote him a uh, an email. And sent it to his um, his wife, basically saying, "Nah, we need you know. I'm willing to pay for you to stay longer, but you need to be here long. And it is not fair to you know my sons Kahari and Kobe for you to you know come for three days and then they, they don't see you again for a year. And so uh, he stayed longer. He stayed longer. <laughs> so you got you know you had to have those." those honest conversations because he could still get into his his thing, you know. Did he read the letter? I assume he did, that you wrote as part of the documentary. He did, he did. Actually, um, when we were filming that, um, that park that we're in, that park that we're in is really significant. That's, it's called Luella Park. It's on the south side of Chicago. And it, it really was the place, you know, I learned to do a lot. Um, where, you know, for me, basketball was that link between my father and I. If I didn't play basketball, I don't know how I would have gotten time with him. I, I just wouldn't have, you know, because that was his life. And so going to that court, um, working, on my, working on my game, um, playing high school basketball, playing college basketball, those were all, as I reflect on it, those were all ways of me trying to connect with him and stay connected. So I read the poem, um, you know, in the park, which was when he was in the park, and then that was when we embraced, um, because it all kind of rushed back, you know, the feelings just kind of rushed back because the park and him being there, you know, we played basketball in that park. That's where he taught me how to dribble and shoot and stuff like that. This was actually... Uh, a question. I'm not sure who asked it because the student didn't put their name on it. <laughs> but the third question says, was your dad one of your main influences for playing basketball? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it was it's how we made a living, you know. And um, But it, it, it has so many lessons. That's, that's the value of sports is not for you to become a pro. The value of the sport is for you to learn these life lessons in terms of teamwork, how hard you have to work, that every day somebody is, every day you get up and you don't work, somebody else is working. And, and, and that's what you'll take into to your real life experiences. I, 
that's what I experienced as a boy. You know, my mindset is what I had when I played basketball. I'm not going to let you outwork me. That's my mindset, and that's what is, you know, we think helped lead to, to our firm, you know, being successful and being able to do certain things. Yes, sir. Did you only play basketball because your dad was so good at it? Or are you just... Say it again? Did you only play basketball because your dad was good at it? And you try to be like him? Or did you get it because you wanted to do it? I did it. I think I started it. Now, I'll tell you, I remember it precisely when I first went up. You know, he would tell these stories. You know, everybody has parents. You know, your parents tell you these, yeah. these stories, right? <laughs> and he would tell these stories of, you know, I would go out there to the park and be working out, working on my game, you know, so he's telling me stories of how hard he had to work on the cement and these Chuck Taylors, you know, the, with the with the soles falling out and that kind of thing. And um, and so he told, he would tell us those stories and I'm just like, you know, you're a kid, you listen to everything your father said. And so I remember getting up and I said, I'm going to get up and go work on my game. I was maybe seven and I was small, so I'm going to get up and go work on my game. So I get a basketball. Now back then it was a, a leather, it wasn't a composite, it was a real leather basketball. So it was an indoor ball only. It wasn't to be, you shouldn't dribble on the cement. I took the ball, I went up, you know, I'm up there, I'm dribbling with my head now, I'm looking at my shadow, you know, which is totally wrong. You know, you're supposed to be having the head up, right? But I'm, I'm doing this, you know, and I, I came, you know, I came back home, you know, all proud after about an hour or so. Cause I did what my father had done, and then I bring it, bring the ball back. It's all torn to shreds oh, because yes. uh, it was leather, and he was just like, "Boy, what have you been doing?" I said, "Dad, look at this." And so I'm dribbling my head down, and he was just like, "That's not right. Uh -huh. You messed up my leather ball. That's not right." But that was when he said, "If you want to do this, because I have an older brother, he's not in there, that um, my father helped raise, who's my mom's." Um, first son from another marriage. And he never forced basketball on him. He was more of a baseball player. And he, his thing was, I'm not going to force it on you. If you want to play, I'm going to show you how to play right. And so that became our, um, our language. You know, basketball, going to work out and tournament and games and going to watch basketball. You know, so that was a a way for us to bond. And so it was more about connecting with him. And then I then I fell in love with the game myself, you know. So but I came to the game out of love for him and to connect with him. It's interesting because in the film your father talks about how basketball is like a symbol for so much more than just a sport, you know, and he said he always connects it back to fatherhood and, you know, raising up boys to be men and working together and so forth. So yeah. There's a strong connection there. I gave a question to Taylor to ask, and she had two, but I told her just to pick one that she wanted to ask you. So, um, How did it feel, or did it feel any different having a brother of mixed race? Um, I did not, I didn't look at him like different. You know, um, there are a couple things. I think one is the political dynamic in America is that if you um, if you have any black in you you're considered black and that that is that's there's some historical roots to that um, and so you know I never thought of him of I just you know here's my brother um, and it was it was it, here's the interesting part my father um, at times was attracted, I think, in some ways to the Nation of Islam and Malcolm X. Um, and so my middle name is Malcolm after Malcolm X. My brother's middle name is Muhammad after Muhammad Ali. Both of them were um, in the Nation of Islam and Muslims. Um, and yet, you know, so there's a, you know, this, this sense of black pride. And then at the same time, he's having this um, secret um, affair with a white Canadian woman. And so, you know, it's this contradiction, right? You know, it really, it really is. And, um, and even today when we have conversations, he talks about how um, racist Canada can be, um, 
you know, but he just is, he's living, you know, the life, you know, he's experiencing what happens at times in Canada, he'll come back, he's like, you know, I don't know how, I don't know how y'all deal with that in the States, it's so racist there, but it's still racist up here too, man, and so he has all of this, you know, happening, um, but his position is you love who you love, um, you know, that's his, that's his position, and uh, which has been interesting because most of my work has been around really focusing in, in, in empowering the African American community. So that that's really a large part of of the work that I've done as a civil rights attorney and as a um, as an activist is um, you know helping to try to uh, gain rights and expand rights primarily for um, folks in the African American community. I mean, I work with folks from all communities, but I mean, I don't, I, I don't mince any words about, that's my, I believe my primary work on this earth is to try to help um, black folk get healthy as a community. And uh, unashamedly, you know, we do that. And, and, and I love my uh, brother, and um, and love and respect his mother, and, and we just have to figure out how you do that without um, disrespecting other folks, other people. You know, how do you build something that you feel like your community needs, and then not, you know, and you're not feeling as though you're attacking someone else? Where'd you get that car from? My sister. Who's your sister? Okay. All right. I have some of those. I'm like, I've got that. I was about to give some of those out today. All right. Yes, ma'am. Um, this goes back to you meeting your father at an uh, older age. What advice would you give for so a teenager who meets their father at an older age? Like, how would you give them, even if they didn't meet, how would you get them to try to communicate? What advice would you give? Well, my, my dad, he and I, we, I, I grew up with him. It was my brother that I met later. Um, but, you know, my brother, you know, it's always interesting to hear my brother's perspective of um, when my father moved to Canada. So when I, when I graduated high school, so in the eighth grade, my father left. And it, was, it, was, it was a relief. It really was. It was a relief because living in a house where there is this constant threat of an explosion um, makes it difficult. You know, you're on, I'm like on pins and needles, like, like what's gonna happen today? Is he gonna jump off today? Is he gonna get crazy today? And it just, it, it's, it's, really, it's really unnerving, it's traumatic. And so in eighth grade, I remember when he left, uh, he, he, you know, gave me a hug, he said, man, I'm gonna see you. And, uh, Saw him drive off, and I was like, whoa. And then um, he was out of the house all of my high school years, which was, in Chicago, difficult because that was when gang violence and gangs had really started to, to rise. This was in the, um, in the mid-80s. In the mid um, and so he, he stays in Chicago, but he doesn't live with us. Once I graduate high school, then he moves up to be with my brother. And so my brother has a perspective of never having lived with my father. It was very um, different. It was a challenge for them to build a relationship. Um, sure. um, it was a challenge for, him to, for them to build a relationship, but I think they were able to, to build it, and it was, it was difficult. You know, most of the time that I, what I've seen, even in, in the work that I do as an attorney and as an activist, parents are doing the best that they can, you know. Um, when parents walk away or, or not in a child's life, um, it's because they've got some issues, you know. Um, and, and to be quite honest with you, sometimes they don't need to be in our lives because they can bring more harm than hurt, you know. So there are periods that 
maybe maybe now is not the time for my father to be in my life. You know, and, that, and I later found out that during that period while I was in high school, he was dealing with, um, you know, some drug stuff, and he was trying to deal with that, and it just wasn't healthy. Um, it hurt. It hurt not to have him. You know, especially as much as I wanted to be around him and wanted him to see me play basketball, because I was doing well in basketball, but he wasn't making no games. And it didn't make sense to me. You know, if, if basketball is our language, if, that, if that's our love language, if that's what connects us, and you don't come to the games, then it says to me you don't love me. And so that was hard. And that was really, really hard. And so my mom really tried to compensate. She made every game. She took me to eat. We, we would go eat before each game. We go have a soul food, uh, there's a soul food restaurant we would go to. And, you know, and we would, that was a ritual that she established to try to, um, you know, compensate. Yeah. Um, when you read the letter to your father, like, how did you feel and how did it, like, how do you think it made him feel after reading it? Um, I thought he, um, I thought he got it. I thought he got it. I really do. It, it, it for me, um, it allowed me to release, you know, get stuff out, you know. So it, um, it affects you. It affects you. But it's okay. To, um, to embrace how you feel. Because if you don't, um, I think it, it can be detrimental. You know, when you, when you suppress and suppress and suppress, you explode. So, it's, so you got to figure out ways constructively to, to tell your story, to, um, to address what you're feeling, um, to hear what other folks are feeling. And it's okay. I wrote a, I wrote a, uh, a book of poetry um, in maybe the early 90s. And uh, the title of the book of poetry was Black Men Ain't Supposed to Cry. And uh, it, it addresses the fact that in our society, you know, the emotions that we're supposed to have as human beings are so often um, suppressed and, and, you know, feeling and crying, um, you know, you get popped. What you crying for, boy? You know, that leads to pushing down those feelings. It's all right, you know. And so um, my hope is that when people see hard work, when they read what I wrote, that they um, know that it's okay to share what you're feeling. And particularly as it relates to family and how um, how to reconnect um, with your family, because that's for me. I think that's the foundation is how you build family so that you can build community, so that you can build a different um, a different world. But it starts with the family. It's it's in in an African American context, the family during the enslavement of Africans um, in America was the first unit of resistance. It was the first way to try to hold together um, a sense of belonging or being. And so I think that is real. And then in reading um, the book and, and looking at Ruth, you know, it's interesting the family, you know, and the, the family and the heritage and all of those things being connected. Yes, ma'am. What is the, I understand with the title of the film, Hardwood, what is the true meaning of Hardwood, like, in your opinion? Oh, that's, 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 you know, my brother, um, he, he, he came up with, uh, with Hardwood as, as the title for the, for the film. Um, I think it, I think it symbolizes a lot. I think the Hardwood is where, um, lessons are learned, um, and it can be difficult, you know, um, that it connected how basketball connected all of us. 
my brother played college basketball, you know, I mean, I think he, he played basketball more for my father than I did, because he, he could have, um, he was about six, he's six, eight, six, seven, so he could have, he could have played overseas a little, but he was just kind of like, <clears throat> I'm done with it, you know, um, I just kind of kept playing as long as I could until my knees got too bad. So I think Harvard is just kind of the common ground that we all, you know, found each other and uh, connect with each other. Do your sons like basketball? They both play. Really? Yeah, they both play, and it's so that's that's an interesting uh, deal in my household. My son, my uh, my oldest son, is a senior, and he plays. They play at Decatur High School, and so um, and so he's. He's, um, and then my youngest is a sophomore. He plays on the JV team at Decatur. And so my, my oldest is going to have to make a decision about whether, and I think he's decided that um, he applied to two schools, um, Howard and Morehouse, and if he can't play at one of those, he'll just be a student. And, and I've had to repeatedly tell him I'm good with that. Like, I don't want you to feel like in, in any way you're not successful because you didn't play college basketball. That's not, you know, I, I don't want you to just go to a school just to play and not really, that wouldn't be the school of your choice um, if you weren't playing basketball. And so that's been a, um, a hard, you know, conversation to reinforce to him. It's good, man. Like, you play high school basketball, you, You've met your Davis commitment. It's the big <laughs> you can let it go. So we'll see. We'll see. We're hopeful that he'll be able to play, um, go to Morehouse and play. But we'll see. If not, I just hope, my hope is um, I'll be able to connect with him and reassure him that he's you're okay. Because basketball has been so, like last night I'm at the Y with him, you know, I mean, it feels good, you know, we're working out together. I'm like, yeah, you know, like, <laughs> working with my son, you know. I'm like, let's go shoot together, you know, I'm giving him shots. That's a, I don't, you know, that's how I learned how to connect. So I'm still using basketball to connect with my own sons. So um, it's where we're comfortable, you know, playing on the hardwood, you know. Hi, how you doing? Good. Um, was there ever a time in your life where you went to do something and you just felt the need to start over and remake yourself? Yeah, yeah, to re remake yourself. Um, you know, I, I had a, a challenging um, college experience. I went to the Naval Academy, and uh, I studied. <laughs> and, um, and there were times that I, I did some, some boneheaded stuff. You know, I was, I was, I was uh, there used to be a rapper, I think he was called Intelligent Hoover. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and so I was. That was me. You know, I was. I was a smart. You know, kid. But I also, you know, my my high school years. I was a little involved. You know, kind of gang affiliated stuff. And so when I went to the Naval Academy, you know, I brought some of that mentality at times, and I would get in trouble. You know stay in trouble and so I I decided my senior year um, at the Naval Academy that I was you know I was better than that and and so I really tried to refocus how I presented myself and, and went at it that way I, I've had to do the same thing I did the same thing in my legal career I started out at a, at a very big law firm doing commercial real estate and, and that's the importance of knowing yourself it hurt. I hated going there. It was a beautiful. My mom, when I went there, I was on the 54th floor of the Bank of America building, the, the largest building in the Southeast, and the, 
um, I was on the highest floor in the, in the tallest building. And I could see Stone Mountain on a clear day. And it was beautiful. My mom came in crying. Oh my God, it's my baby. <laughs> and, uh, and I hated it because it wasn't for me. It was doing, and it wasn't that it was a bad law firm. It was a great law firm. It was a great practice area, but it wasn't for me. And, and so you have to, and so I had to leave. And when I left, I started all over. I was making um, a lot of money. And I started all over um, from the bottom. And you know, I took a loan out against my house and started a law firm with nothing. And that was a remaking. And so I don't think remaking is a bad thing. I think it's, you know, you have to evaluate where you are in your life. You have to evaluate what, what, what really matters to you. And it changes, you know? Like right now, what matters is, you know, what's on Instagram, right? You know? Y'all mess with the social media. Y'all, You know, that impacts and that influences is some of you all. Um, but uh, Snapchat. Um, so that stuff, you know, that stuff can influence. But when you, when you get into a different position, when it's time for you to go to, when you're in college or when you're applying, because you all are where, where you're, so y'all are getting ready now. Um, so you'll you'll start to really realize what matters when you start applying to schools. And when they, you know, you're like, oh, I wish I would have done a little bit more in that class. You know, I needed that A versus the B. Um, and so it, it helps you as you keep going to keep reevaluating. It's okay. Our law firm, we've been. We, we've been tinkering with it for nine years, and we're changing. And it's it's after we figure something out, we say, oh, "Okay, this is a better this is a better thing for us to do." So we make the change. Don't be afraid to do that. You know, don't get stuck. Who's up here? Uh, my question is like, uh, would you rather have had your father like if he was? Uh, faithful to your mom and not um, left her to the other woman. Uh, would you rather have him done that? But that meaning you would never have had your brother. Mm. Wow, that's, that's a. Um, no. I, I. Everything has worked out the way it's supposed to. And I'm, I'm, I'm good with it. Um, you know, I had to go through what I had to go through, you know, um, in high school, and without without him, and you know, I I've had to work to build my relationships with my brother, with his wife. When you think about it, you know, here's a woman who, um, from my family side's perspective knew that my mother was married and engaged in a relationship with my father and had a child. You know, it wasn't an accident. My brother wasn't born by accident. They intentionally had a child. Um, and that hurt, all of that hurt my mother, who I love, you know, who I, at the time, loved more than anything in the world. You know, now you have sons, you know, children, you love them equally. Um, how do I have a relationship with with that with that woman? But when you put it in the context of that's my that's my brother who I love, his mother. So I gotta love if I love him, I gotta love her and and let it go for whatever whatever the reasoning was that you know they felt okay, her and my dad felt okay to, to do it. I gotta let it go. I don't know. I wasn't in that moment. I've gotta just, you know, because me holding any any ill will is not gonna do anything but prevent me from having an authentic relationship with my brother and with my father. So, you know, she comes and to to our home and we're together. You know, we're a family. It, it looks, you know, when you see us out. I, I'll have to send a. We have a picture. It looks real crazy, but <laughs> it's just different, man. It's just different. It's not 
what a lot of families look like, but it's our family. And um, and I'm, I've been really, really proud of what he's done with, with his life. With, and he has two sons now. So his sons are about the age Kobe and Kahari were when we filmed this. So he has these, uh, he has two sons. And um, he's a great father, you know, real focused on trying to take care of his family. I think that's, you know, when you have certain things happen to you, you can either repeat it or commit to doing something different. You know, everybody in here has had an adult um, say or do something that has hurt you in some way. And you have to decide whether you're going to repeat that or you're going to break that. And it's in breaking those cycles that new stuff happens. You know, my sons will be different from me. My prayer is better. You know, um, and his sons will be as well because we've decided not to continue that. You know, that pattern. How much time do we have? Left? We have 15 minutes or so. Oh, okay. Okay. That's cool. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, going back to what you said, like the connection with your fathers and only basketball, like what would you have been if like you didn't have a connection with your family basketball? Like what if you weren't interested in I I don't know, that would have been tough, man. It really would have been. We he's a he's a Chicago playground legend. You know, like everybody in Chicago who knows basketball knows him. And that was hard at times because I was never um, I was never the player he was. I just wasn't. I wasn't that good. I mean, I was good. I was good enough to play Division I basketball, but I wasn't good enough to play professionally, you know, and make a living doing it. And so um, it was hard, you know. People were like, that's Mel Davis' son, you know. And I'm like, you know, doing my little best, you know. <laughs> but uh, but it, it's, it's it, I don't know what, I don't know how it would have worked. I really don't, because he was like a jock. That was his whole, his whole deal. But he stressed education, you know. But that wasn't something, you know. We were going to sit down and discuss a book together. <laughs> that just wasn't like a part of of how we how we rock. It just wasn't. So I'm I'm glad we had that. Yes, sir. What made you and your brother come up with the film? He thought of, you know, I, I don't know what prompted him. Um, I don't know if, you know, he was, so he went to McGill University in Montreal and uh, he started editing because um, he was interested in film. His, his mom was involved in public television um, in Canada. And so he was kind of interested in film when he was younger. He was on. Um, um, he was doing some acting, so he was like on 21 Jump Street, like the old, oh, 20, oh, you know, I, I, the original. He was on one. Yeah, he was one of those little kids. Um, so he was, you know, and he just was interested in film. And so I don't, I, I think this was just a subject matter that he wanted to, to cover. And, you know, he, he told me about it, and, you know, we just went from there. I have a question that's kind of along the same line of hobbies and interests. Um, in the film, your father said, I learned more from being in the Harlem Globetrotters than I ever did from a university. It was like seeing history being made. So for you, are there any experiences in your life that you learned more from than you did from a university? Oh, yeah. yeah. Every day, you know, the, the, I, I, I tell people all the time, when I get up in the morning, I you know, I pray. And I thank God for um, you know for my health, for my family, and you know probably the third thing is is for being able to practice law. I love um, what I do. I love to be able to go out, get up every morning, and know that I'm going to help someone that needs my help. And it's it's uh, it's one of the most fulfilling things that I've I've, I've ever experienced. It it for me. Those of you all that play sports, when, when you're 
you know, you work hard, you practice, you work hard, then you have that opportunity to, to go out and compete. And there's a feeling when you're competing that you just, I mean, you just, it's hard to, to, you know, you just have it. You know, the locker room, the smell of the locker room, all of that stuff is just like the all part and parcel of the experience. And that's what I have had um, in the practice of law. You know, going from here, I'll go and, you know, get to my desk and, you know, start making phone calls and, and talking to people. And people will tell me about these things that happened to them. And I just go, oh, man, well, we got to fix that, you know. And so that has taught me so much about um, people, people's um, capacity to endure, to overcome. I mean, it's very, it's very inspiring. I've, I've seen, I was just with, um, I don't know if you all remember the, the shooting of Jordan Davis. He was a teenager down in, um, um, he was in Florida, but he's from this area, from Cobb County area. His mom, his mom lives up here, um, Lucia Macbeth. And he was in Florida playing music in a car, and um, a guy named Michael Dunn shot him, you know, and shot up the car and ended up killing him. And I was with her this weekend at a, at a film festival called the Bronze Lens Film Festival, and I was moderating um, after we, there's a documentary that'll be on HBO, I think November 23rd, um, called um, um, 10 Bullets, Three and a Half Minutes. And so it, it follows them through the trial and through everything that they experienced. And to be on that stage with her after her 17-year-old son was killed, you know, like this. Um, that taught me so much about the power of uh, love and compassion, and to be able to endure, you know, the loss of a child, and then go out and go around the country and advocate. And so, my experiences as an attorney has taught me a great deal. And I talk about that even with young people in terms of uh, when I go talk to young people about the consequences of thug life and, and decision making, I'm telling them not, it's not what I learned at Georgia State College of Law. It's what I see every day when I go in and I watch a 17-year-old get 10 years to the door because he's with someone who pulls out a gun to get a freaking iPhone. To get an iPhone, you get 10 years because you have a gun. And so that's, you know, sitting in the courtroom and seeing, you know, a row full of people crying and sobbing and a kid, you know, go in and miss the rest, you know, he misses, misses prom, graduation, all of that. He's done. Um, we learn a lot that way as well. Anyone else? I feel like they have questions. I might be a little starstruck. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll just say um, what I share with most young people is I'll, I'll share with you all. We, we, we need you. And what I mean by when I say we need you, there is a, um, a social justice movement that's happening around this country that really needs conscientious, um, thoughtful, compassionate young people. We need you to not just be concerned about getting a good grade, but be concerned about how you can help shape our world in a positive way. There's so many issues that um, that we're faced with, and and you can pick one. You can pick the environment. You can pick domestic violence. You can pick cancer. You can pick racism. You can pick all these isms, but do something. Don't just be satisfied to get yours. Because if, if, if you're spending time and focused on just getting yours, I got to get mine, you know, I need this money. Man, right now, I'm, I'm, this has nothing to do with money, but I will be fulfilled throughout the day having been here. Nothing to do with money. The best things that will happen to you in your life will not involve money. 
it will involve you connecting and building relationships with people. And you saying, I'm going to make a change because I have the capacity to do that. And it's not, you know, like I gotta be on the, you know, from the mountaintop Martin Luther King kind of experiences. It's every single day. When you see another young person, you know, somebody bullying somebody or talking about someone, you can stop it. Because all of that is is within our control and our power. And uh, and I, I just hope that you all understand how much we need you. You know, um, as, as long as I like to live, and I hope I live till I'm 100 plus something, at the end of the day, this world is yours. And what it will look like in the future will be in your hands. And, and you have to accept that responsibility as as marginalized as you may feel, like, you know, I'm just a kid, and they keep telling me, forget about that. What you saw at the University of Missouri were young people who said there needed to be a difference, there needed to be a change. And when the young people take something up, it, it can change the world. If, 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 you, if you look at the civil rights movement, and you will see that on February 1st, 1960, there were a group of four freshmen, 17, 18 year olds, at North Carolina a and in Greensboro, North Carolina. And they went into a Woolworths, and they sat down, and they said, you're going to serve us. And they were refused because they were black. Four students, it was no, Martin Luther King didn't tell them to do it, right? They just did it, because it was just like that moment, that time. And so then when they went to do that, the next day, another 25 students came. And the next day, 100 students came. And then white students came and black students came from all over. And then all over the South, students at historically black colleges in Tallahassee and Atlanta began to do the exact same thing. And white students from the North began to come in and participate in sit-ins and the whole country changed to become four students. 17, 18 year old students said, I want to make a change. That's the power of youth. That's the power in this room. That's the power you all have, is that when you decide and then when you take action, stuff will change. Stuff will change. And Missouri, the University of Missouri situation is just the latest example of that. I was in Ferguson, um, and I saw young people who, you know, tattoos on their face and other people who were coming from colleges. And they were all there together trying to say enough's enough. And then when you read the Department of Justice report that described what was going on in Ferguson, it wasn't a figment of their imagination. It was real. And so we all have opportunities to come together and, and press forward to, to try to change and transform stuff that you don't like. If you don't like it, fix it. That's, that's what I believe. So that's, I'm in the fixing business. I'm not in the complaining business. I'm trying to fix it. Just a warning, we got about two minutes left. So. Yes, ma'am. Like you were saying, like the four students have went and, and everybody, all the um, African American students are sitting, how would you help somebody who is like, certain certain African American students or any person who's sitting, the fear of being in trouble after they do it or getting shot after they do it or something like that? I think um, fear always plays a I get a, I'm, I'm afraid sometimes myself when I go into, court, into a courtroom and I'm protected, I think, in many instances by the law. You don't know how will this impact the rest of my career if I make this argument. And, and courage is really not, it, it's not fear being absent. It's, it's pressing forward in spite of fear. And so it's something that, um, You've got to, uh, it's like any muscle. I think courage is like a muscle. You've got to exercise it in order to get strong with it. You know, you have to, you know, one of the hardest things is when you go in the weight room, you know, after that, after you hit the weights or after you go running, what happens? You're in some pain, right? You're sore the next day. But then you do it another day. Then you do it another day. 
and then you do it another day. And then you get to a point where your body gets used to, so your spirit gets used to you saying, well, if that's the right thing, I'm gonna keep doing that, and I'm gonna keep doing that, and I'm gonna keep doing that, and it gets easier to do because you are now practicing what you are talking about, now you're walking it. And so, um, you know, that's my suggestion. So I'll just tell y'all, I, I really appreciate being here. Um, it's good to see everybody. Um, I've been knowing this little lady since she was like <laughs> real little. Um, but I, I, I'm, I'm glad to be invited. I'm, I'm very honored, my family is honored that, that you all would take the time to consider our story as you continue to figure out things and, and learn and, and do everything you can to just keep embracing education and, and having conversations. So often in our society, um, intellectual things are, are are dumbed down. You know, it's like to be intellectual is somehow to be, you know, other. No, to be a thinker is to really be the people who help direct where the world will go. Thinkers. So don't stop being critical thinkers and asking critical questions. So, thank you.